Hey, it's Pastor, and I want to thank you for joining us today. It's going to be a great day. I know as we pray with expectancy in our heart, God never disappoints us. He's here today, and He's going to do a great thing in our midst. And I just pray that you will enjoy it. I'll be back after the service, and I look forward to that time. God bless you. It's a general question, and if we ask most Christians this question, they would say, yes, do you desire more of God? And you would say, yes, because if you said no, it would be kind of like not good, right? If you said to a Christian, hey, do you desire more of God? And they said, no, got plenty. (laughs) It's kind of arrogant, right? Uh, If you say to a Christian, hey, do you want more of God? And they say, no, I got enough last week. It says something about you, right? So... A lot of times we say, do you desire a lot of God? And people say, yes, I want all I can get of him. And yet we don't know how to define it. We don't know how to say, how am I getting all that I need of him? There's a way you can tell. There's a way that you can work through your life to ensure that you're getting all that God has for you. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. It is possible to maintain a spiritual desire for God and have that desire for the rest of your life. To be just as in love with God the moment that you ask Him to come into your heart, you can love Him and be that close to Him the rest of your life. It takes some discipline, and that's really what I'm going to talk about this morning, is how we become obedient to a place to our God that we can trust Him, and we can get close to Him, and we can desire to be as close as we can. That song we sang this morning, where you do crawl up on His lap, you lay as close as you can to Him, and you just hear Him whisper to you. My little grandbaby, I like to lay him right up here. I want him to feel my heartbeat beating. I want him to feel the comfort of his grandpa. And I want him to know that, son, no matter whatever happens, grandpa will fight to death for you. And I want him to feel that closeness and that connectivity to me. We can have that with God too. First, we've got to remind yourself of how much God loves you. Remind yourself when you feel yourself drifting from God or feeling distant from Him, remind yourself of how much He loves you. Amen? How many of you have had somebody die for you? I hope all of us. Jesus died for us, right? So that's a pretty big commitment. That's a way to look at it and say, wow, I'm important. Because the Bible tells us that if you'd been the only one, he would have died just for you. He didn't look at our criteria. He didn't look at our pedigree and say, I'm going to die for these. He said, I'm going to die for my people. That they might have life. And have it abundantly. So remind yourself in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your tribulation, in that moment that you don't think you're very close to God, remind yourself that God loves you. The more you understand about how much God loves you, the more you're going to love Him. I don't know about you, but I don't know very many people that are lining up to die for my mistakes. In fact, I sometimes look behind me and there's no one. (laughs) People are like, you got into this on your own. (laughs) My mom used to say, you get glad in the same pants you got mad. Wasn't nobody behind me going, now we want to make you happy, honey. (laughs) There's not a whole lot of people signing up to take on my guilt. There's not a whole lot of people that say, Pastor, hey, you go ahead and make the mistakes and we'll take the blunt for you. When it gets tough, usually you see people scatter. Remind yourself of how much God loves you. 
The Bible says in Ephesians 3, 18 and 19, may you have the power to understand how wide, how long, and how high, and how deep his love is for you. His love goes all the way to the pits of hell for you. His love goes all the way to the highest, high, highest heavens for you and for me. His love goes as far from the east to the west for you and me. That's how much he loves us. May you experience Christ's love, though it is too great to fully understand. As much as I feel his love, there's times that I can't act on my feelings because I don't feel so great. There's times I have to just know that he loves me. But even though I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that my God loves me, I do not understand why. I don't understand why. Here is God who knows my weaknesses. Who knows how I'm going to fail him from time to time. He knows that I'm going to come and ask him for forgiveness. But I'm probably going to do the same thing again in six months. Because I'm weak in my flesh. And yet he loves me. He loves me. Someone said something to me this week. When I tried to demonstrate love, they said, so this is what grace looks like? Yes. It doesn't matter because Jesus died for us that we might have life and we don't have to be condemned and we don't have to be torn down. We don't have to waller in the mire, in the pit that the enemy wants us in. Come up out of it and know that your God loves you. Only then and then, only then can you be made complete with all fullness of life. We can't be tugging all that junk around with us. All the sins and the disappointments that we are. The things that we've done. The times that we failed God. We have to let them go. Cut them loose. Be finished with it. We need to understand that the power, it comes from Jesus Christ. And when we recognize that He loves us, everything else has to stop. My second point is stop desiring all the junk the world wants you to be engulfed in. Stop looking at all the things the world has you consumed with. If you really want this desire to be close to God, stop looking at the things that are trying to detract you from the God that loves you. Quit looking at those pictures that says to you, you have to look like this person in order to be loved. Girls, boys, we don't have to live up to the images of the world. We only live up to the image of our God. Spiritual beings are shaped in the God shape. And he has shaped a hole in our heart that only God can fill. All of us are running around seeking all over the world. We're seeking and we're seeking for something to fill us up. Something to fill the void in our life. And in reality, what's happening is God is saying, that hole is only mine. I'm the only thing that can satisfy it. I'm the only thing that can fill and complete that hole in your heart. It's only Jesus. When you try to fill it with your salary, your status, your success, your passions, your possessions, your power, your prestige, or anything else, it's not going to be fulfilling. It isn't going to be fulfilling. And that's why you see people seek their whole life for these things. And when they get them, they're still not satisfied. Do you know that one of the greatest professions that people go into, if you are living in the business world and have achieved success, you know what the top profession is? 
the priesthood. Do you know why it is? Because you've tried everything else to fill the hole and it didn't work. And so then you realize, I got to get in a mission field someplace. I got to go someplace and do something with my life that really, really matters. That's why. Because none of that other stuff will fill what is missing in your life. I sat with a consultant about 20 years ago. And when he told me that, I chuckled inside. I thought, well, <laughs> that's probably not true. <laughs> and then I got old. <laughs> and I began to think, what is my life worth? What have I done? What have I done that's really going to matter for Jesus Christ? I better get after it. I've only got a season left, and i got to get after it. You see, you want to get engulfed in the things that God wants from you. If you really want a close relationship with Him, get engulfed in those things. Proverbs 15, 14 says it like this. A wise person is hungry for knowledge, while the fool feeds on trash. You are feeding yourself on trash to believe that you can live a complete and full and happy, fulfilling life without Jesus in the midst of it. Making God your number one goal is my third point if you're keeping track. Happiness is a byproduct of knowing God. If you really know God, you are a happy person. Because you cannot be unhappy and be thankful at the same time. And God calls us to be thankful people for every blessing He has provided. And I'm looking at a crowd of people who had a home and a roof over their head last night. We're thankful for that. I'm thankful that God feeds me and allows me to partake of the good things in life. I'm thankful that God takes care of me. But in order for me to be really close to Him, I must make Him my number one goal. Not my cars. Not my house. Not the things that the world tells me. But He must be first in my life. It's often that we Christians, we find time to do everything else in life. Everything. Everything. There's nothing off limits. We'll stay up all night long to watch a good ball game. But if church goes past 8 o'clock, <laughs> we're tired. That was my best yawn. We'll, we'll, work, we'll work hours upon hours. But when we need something at church, we're not going to see you. We're tired. We're tired. Well, if Jesus Christ is our number one goal, what do you do when you have a goal? You strive for it. You put everything else second. And you make that goal your goal. And that's how you accomplish them. You accomplish them by getting there. To become debt free. You can't sit and hope that you're going to be debt free. That didn't work for me. All I did was keep signing up for credit cards. Oh, this one's zero interest. <laughs> yeah, I'll take that one. And that one's zero and I'll take that one. And then you're not getting debt free. When you want to get debt free, you stop buying things. And you start focusing on paying for what you got so that when you get there, you can pay for what you bought. Then you're debt free. And then you experience the goodness of the feeling of the goal. The same thing is true with Jesus Christ. If He is first in your life, then you spend your time with Him.
I knew it might start getting quiet at this point. No, you're not leaving. I locked the back doors. But (laughs) when you get close to Jesus and you make him your number one goal, he brings everything else into alignment. You can have a happy marriage if Jesus is your goal. Because you know why? If Jesus is your goal, that thing you're fighting and arguing over is a whole lot less important. If your ultimate goal is to please the Lord of heaven, then it doesn't matter that you overspent your part of the paycheck this week. It doesn't matter. In the scope of eternity, it will not matter. And so when you look at things in the scope of eternity, if you look into things through the lens of Jesus Christ, they're a whole lot less important, and you'll stop fighting with your spouse about it. Whoa, that's good, that's good. Make him your goal. And the other things will become less important to you. When he is your goal, all the other things will align to that goal. That's why when he is your goal, it doesn't matter if you win a trophy, if you get rewarded, if you are pointed out and patted on the back, it doesn't matter. Because you realize that your God has seen exactly what you have done. And that He has taken account of that. I'm thankful for a home where I watched my father make God his very first priority. Because when he made God his priority, he wasn't focused on who took advantage of him. He was only focused on, did God find pleasure in my life? My fourth point, get into God's Word every day. The Bible is food for our soul. And you will starve to death without the Bible. I believe we've got to be in a Bible-believing church where the, the power of God and the word thereof is preached and it is taught. But I can tell you that if you only get fed once a week or maybe twice a week, you will go hungry. I start shedding pounds if I miss one meal. That's why I don't miss them. But if you only think that you get the Word of God in here on Sunday mornings or on Sunday night or on a Wednesday night, then you are starving yourself from the spiritual anointing of Jesus Christ. Because you need a daily feeding on the Word of God. That may come in you sitting down and reading your Bible the first 15 minutes of the day. That may come at you taking your lunch break and sitting down and spending that time in the Word of God. That might come in you being in the car and turning on a Christian radio station that has a devotion and listen to the Word of God. It might come in you putting something in that allows you to hear the Word of God. You can use your phone to go to the Bible app and when you get there, you can have it played in your ear all day long and And you think, well, I'm not really concentrating. The Word tells me that Thy Word I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against Thee. It means that when I need it the most, it will come to my remembrance. When I need to know, is this right or wrong? The Holy Spirit will use the power of God's Word to convict your life and direct you in the way you should go. Get into the Word every day. Eating one meal a week is not going to do it. In the same way, you need to feed on God's Word every single day. Pour it in. You must crave spiritual milk. One of my boy's friends 
has a saying. When something's really good, he's like, that's like mama's milk to me. When you get that, the only thing that satisfies my grandson is my daughter-in-law. Because she's carrying the milk that satisfies him. The only thing that will satisfy you from a spiritual perspective, the only thing that will satisfy you is the milk that comes from the Word of God. That is it. That is it. Well, you know, I listened on the radio and I heard Kenneth Hagin and I heard Joel Olstein and, and I heard Brother Hagee and I heard uh, Franklin Jensen and I heard all that and, oh, I'm, I'm full. You're not full until you get into the Word of God and you let that Word speak to your heart. You can't even get full on Sunday mornings when I'm preaching. You know why? Because I'm up here telling you what I've studied and what God has spoke to me and what's in my heart. But God wants you to know this word even as well as I would know it. It's what he requires of us is to get in that word and understand it. That's why in 1 Peter 2, 2, he's telling us that we've got to get into that. We've got to crave it like a newborn baby. We've got to there want it because that's the only way we grow. You cannot grow spiritually unless you get into the word of God. You need it. My fifth and final point this morning in case you're keeping track. Our desires are influenced by association. This is the point where we go to meddling. If you hang out with people who only care about politics, what are you going to care about? If you hang out with people who only care about sports, what are you going to care about? If you hang out with people who are only interested in their work, what are you going to care about? If you only hang out with people who are only interested in their self and no one else, what are you going to care about? It's getting kind of quiet. If you guys don't know the answers, we'll put them on the board for you. If you are hanging out with people who are just like you, you probably will not experience anything new from God. Oh. I don't, know where, I don't know where this stuff comes from. We are influenced in our desire by God, by the people we're hanging out with. And if you are hanging out with people who never pick up the word of God and read it, then you are influenced by that. If you are influenced by people who listen to all kinds of music come into their head and that music carries connotations and words and destruction in it, then you are influenced by it as well. And the Bible tells us that we should rise up a standard against it. That we must... Oh, pastor, you get off the music. No, I like a little Van Halen. <laughs> and I heard him say Jesus once, so he must be a Christian. I don't care about Van Halen. I don't even know who he is, to be real honest. People say to me, did you see the eagles? I said, well, did they fly by? That's how cultured I am. I don't know those things because when I grew up, I didn't hang out with people who were listening to the Eagles. Except my wife. <laughs> I'm not throwing stones, baby. <laughs> I wanted to hear some Jesus music. Do you know why? Because inside, I needed it. I had this big hole, this big hole of hurt. In emptiness. This big hole that said I was a nothing and I was a nobody. 
This big hole inside of my heart that said that I could never make anything out of myself. I had a hole. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to get as close to Jesus as I could. Because he was the only thing that gave me satisfaction. And I know that without him, I am nothing. I am nothing. Oh, well, Pastor, you were successful in business. I want you to know one thing. I never went to business one day without my Bible opened on my desk and reading his word because I knew even in business I couldn't be successful without my God. I want you to know that many times they toted this little boy right up to the HR office to tell me that my religion had to go. And I want you to know that I told them it wasn't going anywhere because it was part of me. It's in me. It is me. It's the desire to know God. I still have this unsatisfied, unquenchable desire to get close and closer to Him. I want to know Him better. I hope you enjoyed the message today. My prayer is always that God will meet with us and that it will be meaningful to your life. As I pray and I go into God's Word, I really look for a way to communicate in a, in a sense that you can put it in your life and let it make a difference in you. So I pray that today's message did make a difference for you. If you have any questions or you need help with something, please don't hesitate to call us here at the church. You can reach us on our Facebook page or you can call us here at the office. We'd be glad to take your call. And we look forward to the next time we can be together again. Thank you for joining us.